Okay. Um, so uh, before we have learned uh, how we uh, have general ideas for the LPCA, and uh, we know that um, LPCA is very important tools for dimension reduction. And uh, so in our introduction for functional data analysis, uh, I mentioned that uh, now functional data actually can be sparse. So uh, the, 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 the tools to handle sparse data is the FPCA. So I will show you now how we handle the sparse uh, functional data using LPCA. So this is we learned before. So now let's look at uh, uh, how we do the LPC on the sparse functional data. So this is uh, one example. Um, this is the um, uh, famous uh, ads cohort study. So basically the um, uh, uh, record the CD4 percentage um, for uh, 283 uh, homosexual men uh, who become HIV positive between year 1984 to 1991. So the uh, CD4 percentage is a commonly used marker to describe the health status of the HIV infected uh, persons. So on um, this graph is to show you uh, the longitudinal CD4 percentage. And uh, so we have uh, 283 subjects and uh, you can see the observations is irregular and the number of observations per subject ranged between one and 14 with the median of six measurements, okay? And uh, so very sparse data. So our goal here is that I want to show you uh, how we estimate the underlying functions. And uh, um, so you can see here, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, the four individuals. And you can see here, uh, even for uh, individual 47, uh, it only have one of the reasons, the observation it's marked at the circles. So you will just have one data point uh, using LPCA, we are able to recover the whole uh, 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 trend, whole curve for these uh, individuals using LPCA, okay? So, uh, so now let me show you how we do it. Um, so here is the question. Uh, so basically, uh, we have uh, um, some noisy observations, discrete observations, yij for the curve, xit. And uh, so i is the index for the subject, j is the index for the uh, time points. And uh, so we assume that the data are sparsely and irregularly observed measurements. And our goal is to estimate the underlying function xit. So, um, so basically uh, here, uh, we assume that uh, the curve xit is an independent realization of a smooth random function xt uh, with I know mean function um, uh, ext equal to mu t and a covariant function uh, gst. Okay, so um, so the uh, epsilon ij is the RID measurement errors uh, with mean zero and a variance sigma square. So then uh, we can calculate the covariant function yij yil uh, equal to the 
current function of x i t uh, at a time t i j and t i l um, plus the uh, sigma square times delta i j because we have this uh, memory error epsilon i j right so we can calculate the current uh, y i j uh, with y i l based on uh, this formula right so delta j l uh, is equal to uh, one if j equal to l and zero otherwise okay so this is a this is the uh, current function for y i j and y i l okay so any questions so far okay great let's continue so now um so what we can do is that uh, because we assume that all this uh, uh, curve xit has a common mean mu t, right? So what we can do is that uh, we can pull the observations from all the subjects. So these various circles are the observations from all subjects. And then we can uh, estimate the mean function mu t based on all this data. So then we get the mu of t, mu of t, right? So we add the mu of t by pulling all the data together. Okay. So after we get this mu of t, so after we pull all the data together, we can do uh, any non-permission regression method to do it, like a local polynomial regression. Uh, um, it's most commonly we use to estimate the mu of t. Okay. So after we estimate the mu of t, um, we can then estimate the covariance function. So, um, so we can first calculate the raw covariance. So the raw covariance is the uh, product of yij minus the mean function times the yl minus the mean function. Okay, so this we call it gi. Okay, so for each pair of time point, Tij and Til, we can get this Gi, right? Yes. And uh, then we can calculate that the expectation of Gi uh, equal to uh, the, uh, as we do before, is equal to the covariance uh, Yi at Tij uh, and Xi Til plus the uh, sigma square times delta i l. So j l equal to one if j equal to l, and j l equal to zero if j not equal to l. So then uh, what we can do is that we will estimate the covariance surface um, G hat st um, with the local quadratic smoother on the off diagonal raw covariance gi. You can see here the expectation of the gi on the off diagonal elements will be just equal to this current function, right? Because uh, jl here, delta jl here will be equal to zero, right? Yes. So we were just using the off diagonal raw covariance gi. We will do the smoothing on this off diagonal raw covariance GI, and we will get the estimated current surface G hat S of T. Okay. And then um, we can do the uh, local linear smoother on the uh, diagonal raw covariance GI. Um, so in the diagonal, raw covariance gi delta jl equal to one right so so this basically is this current function plus sigma square so then we can assume the sigma square as the uh as the difference between estimated vt minus um gtt okay 
Uh, so this is the estimate for sigma square. So this is the estimate of the covariant function. And after we got the current function, uh, we can do the uh, orthogonal decomposition, uh, orthogonal expansion for the GST. So GST can be written as a, a linear combination of phi ks times phi kt multiplied by lambda k. So here, um, phi kt is the eigenfunction of LPC, lambda k is a nine increasing eigenvalues. Okay, um, so uh, we can estimate the LPC um, by solving the eigen equations uh, for GST. It's a, it's a similar as we, what we did for when we estimated the LPC for the regular uh, functional data. Uh, so basically, uh, we will evaluate uh, the G hat ST at uh, some fine grade time points. Then we will get a currency matrix, and then we will look at the uh, eigenvectors for the currency matrix. Uh, that will be uh, the, the, the eigenfunctions at these uh, uh, grid points. Okay, so this is how we get the LPCs. So uh, th this graph, it shows the uh, estimate of the LPCs. And uh, so you can see here uh, for these uh, results, it is also similar. The first LPC always positive, and the second LPC is uh, negative in the early part and uh, positive in the later stage. Okay, uh, so this is how we um, estimate the LPCs. Um, so we know that um, in order to estimate the curves, the curve is a linear combination of LPC and the coefficient will be the LPC score. So in order to get the curves, estimated the curves, we have to know the LPC and we have to know the uh, LPC scores. So, um, so in the past, um, we know that uh, the LPC uh, scores uh, can be calculated as a numerical integration, right? It's a um, inner product of XIT uh, uh, multiplied by the LPC. And here, the XIT has to be minus the mean curve. Okay, so, but uh, when we do this uh, uh, numerical integration, we have to um, evaluate this, uh, uh, write down this new integration as a uh, summation, right? And in the summation, we have to evaluate the XIT at a, a fine grade point. But we don't know XIT now, right? So uh, we don't have the observed XIT either. So therefore, we cannot use this formula to estimate the LPC score now. So, so therefore, we have to find other ideas. So, um, one fact we know that is that uh, um, if we assume that the LPC score, uh, could see here, uh, this is the LPC score. I'm sorry for the change of the notation. Um, so the LPC score and the measurement error epsilon, actually, uh, if they are jointly Gaussian, then we can predict, we can get that uh, the expectation for the LPC score epsilon IK condition on the data YI, observe the data YI will be 
can be written like this. So this is just the conditional expectation um, from the uh, jointly gaussian. So, so then we can see that uh, uh, this conditional expectation will be the best prediction uh, for the LPC scores. Okay. Um, so, um, so in the in the data, we already have uh, um, estimated the uh, LPC phi uh, and also the eigenfunction lambda and the current function capital sigma. Uh, and uh, we have data yi. We also know the mean function mu i. So we can plug in this estimate and the data yi to this formula and I guess the estimation for the LPC score for this curve. So this is called the conditional expectation. So this method is proposed by uh, Yom, Muller, and Wang in their 2005 Java paper. And they call this method as a pace method. Okay. Uh, and uh, so, so, so this is a kind of a breakthrough uh, for the sparse functional data. So using this formula, we are able to obtain the LPC scores. After we got the LPC scores, then we can get the curves. So then uh, we can predict the trajectory, the curve as uh, this, uh, using this formula, we know the mean function mu of t, we know the uh, LPC function phi chi t and the LPC scores ca c i k. So then uh, we can we can predict the curve x t now. So the choice of k is decided by uh, cross validation uh, based on one liu one curve out prediction error. So this is the prediction uh, for four subjects. So you can see that even one subject only have one observation, we can still can get a predicted curve, right? So after this, get this predicted curve, we can do the following FD modeling then, right? And for this model, we only have two of the reasons. We can still predict the curve pretty well. Okay, so this is the, um, the pace method to estimate the, to do the sparse LPCA. Okay, uh, so I will stop here and uh,